Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation about uh, writing your own kernel crypto accelerator driver. Uh, so a little bit of uh, myself first. So um, I have worked for uh, nine years for Texas Instruments in the Linux uh, kernel development side of things. Uh, and I have been the lead for the uh, baseball team for about five years. I have uh, something like 600 patches merged upstream uh, that I've personally written myself. And uh, about 60 of these are in the crypto drivers uh, section which I am going to talk about today. Also, I'm maintainer for a couple of DI-related drivers subsystems in upstream Linux. <clears throat> and uh, here's also my LinkedIn uh, profile link if you want to contact me for any, any reason. Um, so this uh, presentation is split in three sections. So first uh, I have introduction talking some, somewhat about the uh, basic uh, crypto concepts uh, and uh, what, what uh, these things mean. Then in the second part I have, uh, I'm uh, talking about the uh, meat of this presentation here. So basically implementation details for the drivers and uh, what you need to think, uh, consider when, when doing that kind of things. And uh, third part is uh, some test results. To, so I've, I've done some uh, testing for the uh, crypto drivers that I've, I've been dealing with. So uh, first, uh, starting with the first part, introduction. So uh, what is cryptography? So uh, this uh, cryptography is basically some pretty complex uh, mathematical algorithms to convert data into something uh, unintelligible. So basically, uh, you use some mathematical tools to convert data, plain text, plain text data or uh, binaries or uh, emails or whatever into uh, this kind of format that uh, uh, people who, who are not authorized to do that cannot read them. So um, basically, uh, cryptography is used for three main purposes, authentication. So um, you uh, basically you certify that uh, who, whoever is sending the data or who, whoever is uh, 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 the in initial out for the data uh, is, is actually the person that he claims to be. Then confidentiality is one, one thing so uh, non-authorized people cannot uh, read the data. And then, then we have integrity so nobody can modify the data either and uh, this is this is useful for example if you're serving some software binary so you know, nobody can uh, modify that and in, in insert some uh, viruses or whatever into the data for example and uh, we are using different uh, cryptographic algorithms for different use cases Um, so first about uh, authentication, so um, typically some asymmetric, asymmetric ciphers are used for this like uh, RSA, DSA and so on. And uh, we have uh, two different keys for the uh, encryption decryption for process. So uh, public keys, uh, uh, one uh, a key that can be shared freely and uh, then, then we have a private key which uh, is only, only used by the receiver of the data. And uh, uh, this, this can be used for applications like uh, digital signing, uh, secure view, boot, and so on. And here's a figure on the right hand side. So we have a plain text here. Uh, sender uses the public key to encrypt the data, it uh, converts into cipher text, uh, which basically cannot, cannot be read by anybody except the one that has the private key and uh, you can decrypt the data and uh, get the original plain text out of that. Uh, then confidentiality. Uh, so this the, uh, we are using symmetric ciphers here like uh, AES, uh, DES uh, and so on. And uh, the main benefit for, for these uh, symmetric ciphers compared to asymmetric ones is that uh, these are much faster to execute. So the um, mathematical algorithms used for this one are usually much uh, 
much more faster to do. Uh, the main main negative portion is that uh, uh, we have this uh, private key that both sender and receiver must know somehow, and uh, this is uh, this is the main issue how how to actually share this uh, key so that uh, it it doesn't end into some somebody else, and then that that uh, part can also uh, decrypt decrypt the data that uh, we we try to keep secret. And uh, some applications like uh, HDD encryption, secure message in uh, IPsec, and so on, are using this kind of setup. And the, here's, here's the uh, figure again on the right hand side. Basically, it's similar to the uh, previous one, but uh, the keys are basically the same used by sender or receiver. Uh, then for the uh, integrity purposes, uh, uh, we are typically using hash algorithms like uh, MD5, SHA, and uh, so on. Um, and applications for this is like uh, image integrity checking, password, password storage, and so on. Uh, for this uh, type of algorithms, it's impossible to generate the original data from the cipher text. Uh, um, it's uh, so basically we are just uh, uh, getting the plain text. Uh, we are, are running the algorithm on the plain text, and we get uh, sort of cyber text. Uh, this this should probably be meant, uh, named like hash result here, but uh, I, I get the figure similar to the previous uh, two, so that we see see sort sort of uh, difference of this and. Uh, for these uh, integrity algorithms, we have this optional key. So um, you, uh, you can either use the key or not. Uh, but uh, for, for example, if you are using tools like SHA SUM uh, in, in Linux uh, operating system, you, you, um, you don't provide the key, but it's, uh, it's using the base, base algorithm to just calculate from the plain, plain text. Uh, and uh, you will get the same, same result always. Uh, uh, for, for everybody that's actually using the same, same tool. Um, so going to the implementation side of things. Uh, so um, here I've brought uh, this kind of simple, simplified system architecture diagram, uh, what people might, might have available for their use. So we have this uh, SOC, uh, um, where we have bus and we have CP, CPU uh, and a couple of crypto accelerator blocks here. And uh, basically you want to want to utilize these uh, uh, accelerator blocks to um, make, make your crypto operations faster. Uh, so how, how do you do that? That's, that's basically the um, main uh, topic for, for this talk. So, um, these uh, crypto accelerators, uh, quite often, they uh, utilize some sort of DMA uh, to transfer the data from the accelerator block to memory and uh, back. And uh, CPU is just controlling, controlling the setup of the um, system here. Uh, then, talking about uh, uh, crypto drivers themselves, uh, there's basically a couple of um, main concepts uh, that people need to think about. Uh, this is, uh, uh, these are the transform, which is basically a single algorithm implementing some, some sort of crypto, cryptographic operation. This can be uh, encrypting, decrypting, uh, or ha hashing of data. Um, and then uh, there's the request, uh, uh, which is uh, basically a sing single crypto handle request containing data. And uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this request is always passed to transform and uh, transform is doing, doing um, its magic uh, for the request and uh, provides the results back. Uh, and single transform typically provides a few different operations uh, which, which are using to process uh, the data for this request. And uh, in most cases, uh, we, uh, if we are using this kind of uh, hardware crypto acceleration, we, we need to, uh, or we are interested in using this asynchronous uh, completion mechanism 
because uh, the DMA is doing stuff in the background and uh, we, we can do some, some other processing at the same time. Uh, one one in, important thing to note is that uh, both these provide uh, this kind of context saving uh, area and uh, uh, the, this, this is used uh, during, during the whole, whole lifetime of the transform or the request and uh, it is quite easy when you are implementing things to mix these two and uh, you get some really strange problems there like um, overwriting some other memory buffer or whatever and uh, these, these are quite nasty debug so please don't do that uh, here is a high level uh, crypto sequence diagram uh, so this this is uh, uh, basically using single driver uh, to use uh, single transform and uh, we, are, we are sending data uh, to the driver and uh, do the work here. So basically what happens is that uh, uh, user first in it, uh, issues the mod probe uh, to probe the uh, device driver which provides us the transform. So uh, we get to the driver probe function and then we allocate and create the transform and uh, then we register that uh, created transform back to the crypto core. And one, once the transform has been registered, then, then the user can open uh, uh, this, uh, uh, for, for example, socket in interface using AF uh, uh, AFALG um, type of socket and uh, just uh, uh, sending data over the socket then to the crypto driver which does the processing and uh, then we get the results back and uh, here you see that uh, I've sent a couple of uh, actually two uh, simultaneous or, or, or uh, parallel packets to the driver and they are kind of uh, processed parallelly and uh, we get the results back here and uh, uh, once uh, we have done everything that we want with the data we can close the socket uh, and uh, then also if needed we can remove the whole driver and then, then it will uh, unregister uh, the transforms and uh, uh, release all the uh, memory that was allocated for this purpose. Uh, uh, the, here is a list of uh, kernel APIs for creating a new algorithm. So there's a uh, few different um, uh, types our flavors for this. Uh, the first one here is um, for registering symmetric uh, cipher uh, for like AES and triple this. Uh, then, then we have same for hash uh, algorithms and uh, third one is for AAD uh, which is uh, typically used for um, things like IPsec. Uh, there's plenty of other, others available also, but uh, these are basically the ones that I'll, I'll be focusing on this presentation. And uh, these, these are like uh, used for, for this very, very basic operations. Encrypting data, decrypting, um, creating hash, uh, hash results, and then uh, running our IPsec tunnel. And uh, once a uh, proper register function has been selected, uh, you just need to uh, figure out how to fill the uh, ALG container, which is passed, uh, passed uh, through all, all of these uh, uh, register functions. Uh, for hash operations, uh, we need to register uh, these uh, five, six, uh, six uh, um, API calls and uh, the first one is init so we uh, initialize the hardware state uh, uh, hash and uh, any, any, any driver internal data uh, for the request. Uh, update is the uh, basically the most important one so we are passing the data to the uh, hash uh, through this call and then in the final uh, we close the current hash and uh, return the result for the user. So basically final can be the stage where you actually do all the processing if you have cached all the data uh, from update calls somewhere and uh, then, then we just close, close this here. 
uh, Digest uh, is a combination of init update final, uh, but uh, the crypto core basically requires that uh, you need to implement that one. Uh, then uh, the last two are export and import. So this is basically you um, you can um, save the current state of the hash operation and uh, continue it later. And uh, these uh, these two are typically the most difficult to Im implement because you need to uh, fetch the hardware status some somehow out of your actual reto block and um, store the status uh, to this uh, provided data buffer and uh, uh, then you need to be able to import that back to the hardware once uh, uh, you need to do that. Uh, then a couple of notes about hashes. So both export and import must be implemented and as I said uh, they might be tricky on some hardware. and uh, if it is not possible to implement uh, uh, the export import from the hardware it might be likely that you need to resort to software fallback only in, in cases where export and import are going to be used. Uh, then uh, we need to register proper state size for the um, transform. Uh, so using too small size will ensure some really, really interesting problems and I, I spent my uh, own time debugging these kind of things. Uh, because you, you end up in memory allocation problems if you use wrong state size here. And uh, also one thing to notice that uh, using too large size will get the algorithm also rejected by the crypto core. And the size is actually quite small, it's maybe a couple of kilobytes. Uh, so basically you, you cannot stay, save uh, too much data to this um, state. Um, then here's kind of optimization trick. So use software fallback for small payload sizes because uh, setting up DMAs, uh, uh, IQs and so on can be pretty expensive per packet. And uh, you can actually get pretty large performance boost in some use cases if you do this. Um, and also um, one thing to notice that data will be sent over in multiple chunks. Uh, so you basically get repeated update calls to your driver and uh, you need to be aware of that. And uh, it might require actually quite complex buffering uh, to do this kind of uh, uh, hash, hash driver. <clears throat> then for the Cypher AAD operations, um, uh, so here we basically need to register the set key, uh, encrypt and decrypt uh, calls. So set, set key is pretty obvious. Uh, we are setting the key for the uh, cipher and the encrypt and decrypt are used to uh, uh, process a chunk of data. And um, for these um, uh, ciphers and AADs, uh, the whole chunk, um, chunk of data is actually pro uh, passed in a single call. So you don't need to care about buffering in, in this case that much. Um, additionally, AAD needs to register uh, set out, out size. Uh, so this is uh, the authentication data size for AAD. Uh, so with, with AAD, uh, we are uh, both um, creating the cipher text and uh, then, then we are also um, creating authentication data for, for the additional data that, that, that is passed, passed with the calls. And also with uh, ciphers and AADs, uh, you need to register proper state and uh, request sizes. Uh, so it is, uh, you, you will face really interesting memory handling problems if you don't do that. Um, and Cypher is typically easier to implement than has because uh, the data is passed in single chunk. So if, if you are starting to write some, some sort of crypto accelerator driver, 
you should most likely start, start with something, uh, some cipher algorithm like uh, AES and uh, try to get that working first. And uh, then, then you can improve your driver and uh, get more things working. And also with small payloads, use software fallback uh, similar to uh, as, as I proposed in the hash hashing part. <clears throat> Uh, then about the testing support, uh, so uh, Linux kernel actually has pretty uh, nice uh, setup of um, testing functionality available for uh, crypto accelerator drivers. So there's first is uh, self tests that are done by the crypto core and uh, there's a couple of config options in the kernel that you can just enable uh, to get this done. Uh, and uh, these, these are executed when uh, the driver probes and registers uh, uh, the transforms that uh, it, it is supporting. And um, uh, results for these are seen immediately in the boot log if, if any failures are noticed. Uh, and uh, the status is also visible from the proc file system in the crypto file. And uh, um, there's, there's one, one uh, thing about this uh, uh, crypto tests and uh, if you are writing your own driver is that uh, uh, it is quite easy when you are writing a new hardware driver to uh, actually uh, hang your device in, in a way that uh, uh, it, it is waiting for data uh, from the hardware block and it, it's not coming back because you have used wrong uh, sizes for something and uh, or things like that. And uh, in that case, it might be useful to uh, use this kind of hack in the kernel. I actually tried to upstream that this uh, patch at some point, but um, it, it was rejected because uh, it's possible that in some cases you actually might, may want to wait out for a very, very long time for the uh, results from the crypto core. But uh, if, you, if you are testing your own driver, driver you, can, you can try this patch out and it, it will basically time out if, if your uh, driver doesn't provide the results in a uh, reasonable amount of time. Mm. And then there's also this um, crypto test module, which can be used to um, measure basically uh, throughput of your driver. And it, it will test uh, uh, your transform with different data sizes. And uh, you, you can provide the number of seconds that are going to be executed by the test also. Uh, so uh, for, for this, uh, you basically use this by uh, probing the crypto uh, test module and provide these couple of parameters, mode and uh, seconds of uh, execution time for the test. <clears throat> and uh, mode is basically the uh, uh, use transform uh, for the test. And you, you can check, uh, the source code for the uh, crypto test module to actually see what, what these different numbers are. But uh, there's a uh, provided reference for this 600, which is for AS and for 423 for SHA. Um, then uh, you can also do open SSL testing. So uh, either using AF ALG interface or dev crypto. Uh, this uh, dev crypto is a kernel external module uh, which uh, you, you can install and uh, then then you can use these crypto operations uh, similar to the unix uh, um, uh, crypto dev implementation um, and with openness so you can test for example the speed uh, for certain um, operations and uh, uh, use the um, desired implementation for the algorithms either using this uh, dev crypto or ALG or just use the uh, software implementation uh, on the open SSL library itself. Uh, then also one, one important testing uh, so it is uh, using some sort of IPsec uh, uh, tunnel. Uh, I, I've been using strong swan myself. And uh, you can, once the uh, tunnel is up, you can use IPerf3 or some, some similar tool uh, on top to test the uh, throughput uh, of your uh, crypto operations with IPsec. 
Um, here's uh, some driver optimization tips. So basically, uh, some some of these these should be pretty standard for anybody who has been uh, dealing with the device drivers before. So um, combined processing, if possible. So small data chunks, uh, uh, multiple interrupts, uh, or multiple DMA transfers. Always, always try to combine those uh, somehow, if if possible. So that that will basically save plenty of time if you get, if you can avoid execution of one interrupt and uh, setting setting up things for that and also same same for the DMA because uh, with this uh, uh, crypto operations for example in IPsec we are processing some 1.5 kilobyte chunk of data basically the uh, networking uh, MTU size and uh, if, if you are transferring data. Uh, with almost one, for example, one, one gigabit per second, then you get quite a large number of uh, blocks that you need to um, uh, process. Uh, and then also par parallelism is of obviously one, one important thing. So that, that is uh, quite obvious with the IPsec example, for example, that uh, you can um, queue a number of uh, packets to be processed by the hardware accelerator at the same time. Uh, then also, I mentioned this before, the software fallback usage. Uh, so uh, with the kernel, uh, if you're opening this kind of crypto channel, uh, it, it will use the same um, driver for any, any, any process uh, or any data that goes through the same channel. And if, if you process Usually, this kind of, for example, 1.5 uh, kilobyte chunks, and uh, then occasionally you get like 50 bytes of data to be processed. All, all that goes through your driver, so it, it, it can be really beneficial to uh, use software fallback for this uh, small data size system. Then also, <clears throat> uh, one thing to try to avoid is uh, the scheduling because. Uh, Basically, switching the context uh, from the kernel to potentially even use space or something something similar is, is going to be expensive. So, uh, if, if you are finalizing one request, uh, you, you should uh, check the queue whether, whether you have more data to be processed. Uh, and uh, just uh, process that data immediately. So, that, that can also help improve things. Uh, then, um, basically, the last part of my presentation is about the test results. So, I've used a couple of uh, Texas Instruments platforms for testing things out. Uh, I, have, I have AM57XX EVN, which is uh, Cortex A15 uh, dual core uh, SOC uh, running at 1.5 GHz MPU speed, and it's uh, on B7 architecture. And it has uh, neon ac acceleration. Uh, available. So uh, this uh, uh, neon uh, kernel crypto drivers can be used with this uh, board. And it also has DI uh, OMAP family crypto IPs in use, so this can be used for crypto acceleration. Uh, then I have J721 EVM, uh, which is Cortex A72 dual core running at uh, 2 GHz, and this is RV8 R6. Um, the uh, CPU core has crypto extensions enabled, uh, so we can use the ARM standard uh, uh, CE drivers for the crypto operations. And uh, then it, it also has this kind of TI SHUL crypto accelerator block, which provides a uh, number of uh, um, algorithms that we can use for, for that. <clears throat> So uh, what I've done in the testing are basically tested both uh, hardware accelerated and software mode crypto uh, with this um, crypto test module. Uh, and ba basically just using, uh, pr probing the crypto test module with um, specific modes. Uh, I've used this uh, 600 volt AS and uh, 4234 SHA. And uh, it, it will provide you plenty of uh, results, but I've uh, just captured, captured the 128-bit key results for this. 
Um, I also slightly modified the crypto test module because uh, normally it only executes data up to eight kilobytes or something. So I modified it to run up to 64 kilobytes. So that, that is going to show the benefits of uh, hardware crypto acceleration better. And uh, CPU load is also measured additionally in all tests. Um, so <clears throat> looking at the results on the AM57XX, uh, uh, so this one is uh, with uh, SHC uh, hashing speed. So looking at the numbers, uh, uh, this uh, yellow and uh, green curve are for the uh, neon operations and uh, red and blue are for hardware accelerated operations. On the right hand side, we have uh, CPU load. So going up to 100% here. And uh, left hand side, we have uh, the bandwidth uh, for the, uh, or actually the throughput for the operation with uh, decrypt. So it goes up to 200 megabits here. And uh, on the bottom, we have uh, uh, the block size uh, from 16 bytes up to 64 kilobytes. Uh, so what we can see from this figure is that uh, with the neon acceleration, uh, the CPU load is 100% all the time. It is kind of expect expected because uh, we are using uh, pure software uh, implementation to run all the crypto operations. And uh, for the bandwidth, uh, it actually starts pretty low. It, it is kind of expensive to run these very small uh, payloads for the operations, and it's uh, 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 goes up quite steadily up to about 100, uh, 120 megabits or so, and uh, saturates on there up from two kilobytes or so of uh, block size. Uh, the hardware acceleration, however, shows kind, kind of different uh, behavior here. So uh, the bandwidth uh, also starts really slow uh, and uh, it gradually gets higher and goes up to something like uh, almost 200 megabits. But what, what is more important is the CPU load. So it, it starts basically at 100% here with uh, small block sizes. Uh, so basically setting up all the DMS, uh, IQs and things like that are going to consume all the available processing power we have. And uh, then it starts to go down and uh, it actually gets pretty low when, when you get the, this, this kind of decent size uh, blocks here, it's maybe 5% uh, CPU load or something like that in the end. Uh, IPsec is an interesting case. So for IPsec, we get to some, something like 1.5K. So you see that the, the CPU load is also already getting lower on, in that setup and uh, uh, the bandwidth of uh, uh, this uh, hardware accelerator, this is the blue line and uh, the software uh, line are getting closer. So you, you will see some benefit uh, in the uh, CPU loading of the system here. Uh, the ne next slide is uh, about uh, AES uh, algorithm, so symmetric cipher. And uh, here, here we have um, pretty similar figure to the previous one. Uh, the band bandwidth and uh, CPU numbers are on, on the left hand side. So basically it's uh, 100 megabits here or 100% CPU loading. And again, we have uh, the uh, blue, uh, uh, green and yellow lines for the uh, software, uh, software algorithms and uh, red and blue for the hardware accelerated. So uh, the neon operations basically consume 100% CPU all the time. And uh, it, it goes quite rapidly uh, to one, 100 megabits per second throughput uh, uh, when the block size is increased and uh, saturates over there. And uh, for the hardware accelerated, we will see similar thing that happened on the previous slide. So CPU load starts from 100% and uh, it starts to get down once uh, the block size is increasing. 
uh, here also you, you see that uh, the blue line doesn't get that high. So uh, it, it, is, it means that the uh, hardware accelerator blocks itself is saturated on the performance. So it, it cannot provide any more performance here. Um, here's uh, the results for the J7. Uh, this is uh, again quite similar to what was seen in AM57, but the numbers are quite a bit different. So again, CPU load is on the right hand side uh, for the CE operation, which is the software. Uh, it, it goes to 100% obviously all the time. And uh, the throughput uh, for the software operation uh, gets almost to one gigabits per second here at the high end. <clears throat> uh, the hardware accelerator block also so similar behavior. So uh, CPU load gradually gets lower when the block size increases. Uh, but uh, the uh, hardware is designed so that uh, the maximum throughput for the SHA block is around 200 megabits. Uh, so it is getting saturated here at the uh, pretty, uh, quite, quite a bit lower than what, what the software can provide. And uh, the, here we have similar num numbers for the AAS uh, uh, algorithm. So again, uh, software is uh, 100 mega, uh, one hundred percent loaded, loaded, and uh, uh, the throughput gets to some somewhere like uh, two point four gigabits per second or something like that. And uh, with the uh, hardware accelerator, the CPU load starts getting lower again at one one point five kilobyte chunks and uh, the throughput saturates somewhere like 300 megabits per second again. <clears throat> um, so um, I did uh, talk about the software fallback implementation earlier. So you will see here that uh, what, what, what is the reason to do that. So basically um, this, uh, uh, all the numbers that we have, maybe up to one, one kilobyte here. Block sizes uh, are very, very low for the hardware accelerator compared to the software pure implementation. And still at the CPU load for both is going to be about 100%. So basically if you use software fallback for, for this area, you get a uh, uh, similar performance as what, what we get with this uh, uh, CE driver directly. Um, yeah, that's actually the last slide in my presentation. So um, thanks everyone. And uh, uh, I believe there's going to be Q&A session after this. <laughs>